How's everyone going today? <laughs> I don't even think that made sense. How's everyone going? Let's give it up for the band leading us in worship, man. That, that Egypt kind of got there, didn't it? How beautiful is it to see all of these young families that are dedicating their children to the Lord. I think that many of us sitting in this room did not have that blessing in our lives. And I think that all of us would say there are so many things that we could have avoided if we would have been dedicated to the Lord, if our parents had been dedicated to the Lord. And what we strive to do is always break generational curses at Genesis Metro. And, you know, I was raised in a non-Christian household and many out there would say like how, you know, the only reason why, you know, you hear skeptics and atheists and agnostics, they say like, you know, the only reason why you go to church is because your parents went to church, you know? And I'm like, well, au contraire, mon frere. <laughs> My parents did not go to church. Um, and so I just want you to start thinking about that what you are doing as parents is creating a platform, creating a foundation. And then what happens as they get older is that they will reference that foundation. Now, will that prevent them from going what I refer to lovingly as the jack wagon years? No. No, you will have some of those. And it lasts varying amounts of time. But what I have learned um, over the last 30 years of preaching and pastoring is that when you lay that foundation, the probability of your child when they become adults um, and they settle down and they have their families, you know what, they think, you know what, what do I need in my life? I know I need that in my life. And so I just want you to know that, that you're planting during this season, especially in this early season, when they're zero to fifth grade, um, those are some of those critical years that you need to plant and you need to prioritize church, uh, prioritize putting godly principles into place so that it's not your wisdom that's leading them, it's God's word that's leading them. And we're starting um, a new series. Um, one of our pastors that serves in our few staff uh, had his Sunday debut last week. His name is Corey McEwen. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Crushed it. Empty every arrow, man. God has a chance to change your potential. If you weren't here last Sunday, it's in our archive on YouTube. Feel free to go check that out. I'm going to build upon that and, and really maybe back up a little bit uh, today. And, and what I wanted to do is, is start thinking a little bit about, um, I think that everyone in here, you know, you have something in your life that you'd like to change, Right? Whether, you know, in the first of the year, we're always generally thinking, you know, all right, I've got to get back in the gym. Anybody, anybody have that thought over the Christmas break when you gorged yourself, right? It's like, no, pumpkin pie more, you know. <laughs> okay, it's time. i got to get in there. Anyway, you know how it is. And so we all have some things. And then if we dug a little deeper, we have some things that we'd like to change probably about we hand, the way we handle relationships. You know, all of us tend to have some areas where it's like, you know, I get angry too easy or it could be the other way where I let people walk all over me too easily or maybe I'm blinded sometimes by a task and I don't have time for people. Maybe I like people so much I don't get anything done. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot of ways that we can get it wrong. There's seemingly a very few amount of ways that we can ultimately get it right. And so I think that there's no doubt that we have things that we want to change, uh, maybe about our, our physical nature, maybe about our emotional nature, but we also have things that um, I agree that with you that there's, there's probably some things in our spiritual lives that we'd like to change. I don't think that anyone sitting in this room is like, I want to be further away from God um, at the end of 2023. And so I thought we might take this Sunday and say, ask some questions like, how, do, how does it work exactly? How does change work from a biblical level? And then it gives us a litmus test to measure up what we're actually thinking. Because I think a lot of times people have a desire without a plan, right? And a desire without a plan is a hope. <laughs> and uh, if you're hoping to change, then I will almost certainly guarantee that you will not change. And so as we're thinking about this, I wanted to title today's message, It Takes What It Takes. Uh, Nick Saban was famously uh, caught quoting that, and as I researched that, it's actually from a book. Um, so if you want to pick it up and read it, you're more than welcome to. But um, it's just another one of those like how-to books on uh, change or 
or implementing discipline in your life. And so I want you to think about that phrase, it takes what it takes. And um, a couple of questions I'll ask you about change. Number one, if you're thinking about changing, the first question you have to answer is, do you want to change, right? Do you want to change? Now just think about that for a moment. And if you started going through like a long, like, you know, well, I don't know. You know no, it's yes or no. It's yes or no, all right? It's yes or no. Has anybody ever asked someone a yes or no question and gotten like a story? Has anybody, anybody got that? Like, you know, I, I think sometimes God just makes it so simple for us. Do you want to change? Because this is universally true. If you do not want to change, you will not change. And you've seen people that are going through terrible things, terrible things that they are doing, terrible decisions, terrible patterns in their life. If you were dating someone, listen to me, I'm going to save you. <laughs> Quit making excuses for bad behavior. When they show you who they are, believe them. Believe them. And so don't, don't think that putting a ring on it is going to change them. It generally is not going to make them better. You're finally going to see even more. I promise you. Anyway, I don't. Know, that's not the sermon. That's for free. Anyway, do you want to change? Yes or no? Second question, what do you want to change? What specifically do you want to change? Right? Because I think sometimes if you haven't drilled down into the root, then you would never get there, right? And so you have to say, like, if you're like, oh, I want to be a better person. Oh, that's, that's great, right? Uh, or I want to get in better shape. Oh, okay, what's your plan? You know, you're going to go three times a gym, you're going to go four times a gym. You're going to get cardio, you're going to get a little hit, you're going to get a little, you know, randomized so that you can get the heart rate up, bring it back down. A lot of times, if you just do seven minutes of, you know, variant cardio with, you know, lifting in between uh, and hyper reps, you know, you can get 45 minutes of workout done. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. I'm just saying that most people that work out, you know, you don't have a plan. And the reason why you're not getting the results, even if you're putting in work, is because you don't have a plan. Um, and then the last question is, why do you want to change? And this is the most important one. Why do you want to change? So do you want to change? What do you want to change? And then why do you want to change? Um, and I'm going to suggest that our text is going to give us some insights into that if it's, oh, you know what, I'm going to save that. Why do you want to change? Uh, in this book, it says that choice is an illusion for people that want to achieve at a high level, okay? And what that simply means is if you want to be a great athlete, then you really don't have a lot of choices, do you? Like you can't just eat whatever you want and be a great athlete. If you want to be a great doctor, you cannot you know, say, you know what, I'm going to get my GED and, you know, just start, you know, operating on people, right? Um, unless you live in Russia. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Apologize to all my Russians in the room. Um, but if you wanted to be a great husband, think about that, for instance. You don't get all the same choices as everyone else gets if you want to be a great husband. If you want to be a great father, you don't get to do whatever you want anymore, right? If you want to be a great parent... You lose so many choices. Like, hey, it's 9 o'clock on a Friday. Let's go out. No. It's like that's over, you know. It's like you, you don't want, because like even if you felt like you could, you know that that baby's going to be up and you're going to have to be out. You're just like, please, God, let me get some sleep. That's, that's all I want. You know, you, <laughs> your vacation to you becomes sleep. If I could just get some sleep. Anyway. So as we're thinking about this, if it takes what it takes, and then you have to realize that you don't have choices. As this guy wrote this book, um, he went and he was working as a sports psychologist with different players, different uh, professional players. And one of the ones that he worked with was this guy named Fred Taylor. And he was a running back for the Jacksonville Jaguars, very good, pro bowler. But for his first three seasons, 
um, he missed something like 21 games, okay? In the NFL, that's a lot. There's only 16 of them during the era that he was playing in. And he got dubbed the name Fragile Freddy, right? How would you like it as an NFL awesome player, one of the 1% of humans on the planet, and someone starts calling you Fragile Freddy? And so he met with this sports psychologist, and they did a study of every person on their team that had made it to two contracts, which in the NFL, very hard to do. Most of them only play through their rookie contract, and then their bodies are done. And what they found was there were two things, only two things in common of the 17, only 17 had made it over the last four years when they studied it, and that was guys who came in at 6.30 a.m., and guys that took an ice bath after every practice. And so he went to Fred and he's like, all right, this is what you're going to have to do. You have to come in at 6.30. He goes, what am I going to do at 6.30 a.m.? He goes, I don't know what you're going to do at 6.30 a.m. You're going to have to figure that out. But all these guys that made it, it takes what it takes. And so he came in at 6.30 every day and he did an ice bath after practice every day. And he played in 48 straight games and only missed 12 games for the rest of his eight year after that career. You see, do you see what, see the point of this? Like whenever you're thinking about change, every Sunday, every Sunday you're going to hear a word from the stage that has the potential to change your life forever. And you're gonna walk in here and you're gonna sing the songs and you're going to amen me, and, and I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do. And some of you are going to be like, yeah, yeah. But are you going to show up at 6.30 a.m., and are you going to take your ice bath at the end of the day? Because if you want to change, but you're not willing to do the things that are required to change, then you will never change. An example, in Mark chapter 10, there was this guy named the Young Rich Ruler. Has anybody ever heard of him by show of hands? Okay, 50%, maybe 25%. The young rich ruler was a young man who was arrogant. He was religious. He confronted Jesus and he said, essentially, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, you know, as a Jewish person, you know that it starts with the law and keeping the commandments because the commandments were um, a measuring stick that God intended for your people to use to come to the realization that you can never be good enough to be saved. So he said, you know, keep the law. And he said, oh, I've done that. All my life I've kept the law. Now, let's be honest. Let's just say right there. If you said, you know, one of the commandments is thou shalt not lie. And then another one, there's like, you know, shall not lust. And as a young man, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out. Like this guy had made it all of his life and he never lied or lusted. You know, how old were you before you had broke those commandments? Right? Every, every guy in here, you've lied and lusted at some point in your life, right? Let's just be honest. Amen, pastor. <laughs> Amen. So Jesus said, one thing you lack, you know, because he was rich. That's why he's known as the rich young ruler. He said, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then you can be my disciple. Mark 10, 22 says, at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Mm. It takes connection to achieve correction, okay? So if you're not connected to God, you can't correct the things in your life that need to be corrected. Now remember, the context is Eternity. His eternal course was at stake. And he was unwilling to correct course because he loved his stuff, the things created, more than the creator. Do you think it's possible in the Frisco area? Does anybody think it's possible? I mean, now that Universal is coming in. Do you, I'm just spitballing here. We got the PGA. I mean, you know, I'm just, just throwing it out there. Do you think it's possible on any level that our culture struggles 
with whether or not we love the created things more than the creator. You know, and there's nothing wrong with created things. God blesses his people. Nothing wrong with it. I don't fault anyone in here for being successful, for working hard, for allowing God to use your talent to put you in a position of influence. That's, there's nothing ever wrong about being blessed of God. Just don't forget. <laughs> Just don't forget that he's the one that blessed you and got you to where you are and then you honor him through what you do, whether that's in your money, your time, your treasure. You find a way to honor God and worship him through the talent that he gives you. But here this young rich ruler, he lacked connection. He lacked connection. And I wanted you to start thinking about that. The chance to change begins with that connection. That if you don't have a spiritual connection with God, then your ability to change is impossible. Because the Bible says that we are dominated, our flesh has a nature, has a nature towards sin. Every one of these children, blessed children, love them, pretty children, love them, beautiful children. But do they have a sin nature inside of them? Yes. Where did they get it? You. All right. And where did you get it? Your mom and dad. All the way back to Adam and Eve who fell in the garden. The Bible says that through them... We were passed on through our DNA a sin nature that has this propensity to do wrong, propensity to wander. I will guarantee you if you just do a litmus test in your life of how easy is it to do wrong things and how hard is it to do right things. Getting mad at somebody, easy, easy, you know. Concealing something, secrets that are bad, how easy, easy, telling the truth in hard situations, difficult. Saying you're sorry, some of you, almost impossible. I love doing this. I want you to think the last time in your marriage. Just think about it. For you that aren't married, last time when you were at work. When's the last time that you said, I'm sorry, I was wrong, Full stop. When's the last time you did that? If you haven't done that in the last year, so decade for some of you, you got a problem. You got a problem. You got a pride problem. And I'm just telling you that there's no way you're that good. You narcissist. <laughs> You have to learn to own things that are wrong and that ownership comes from being connected. If the young rich ruler could have been connected, he could have gotten it straight. Not just for eternity. That'd be incredible though. We only want people to be saved and go to heaven. That's, that's a bonus. That's great. That's, all, that's the best thing ever. But for the rest of his life, he could begin to straighten out some of these crooked things that are in his life because now he would be connected. He walked away sad because he had a lot of stuff. And so many times I think people want the things of God, but they're not willing to pay the price of it takes what it takes, right? Salvation is for free, but Christianity will cost you everything. And I think when it starts costing people, that's when they differentiate and they begin to separate themselves from the things that God intends for us to be connected to. On a macro level, for the rest of the message, we'll look at just two connections. We're going to look at a connection to life and a connection to love. One, the, both of them are housed in John chapter 15 when Jesus was preaching a sermon. And so I want you to think about it takes what it takes in order to live the Christian life, in order to be um, in community, in fellowship with God, under God's umbrella of favor in your life, the abundant life that Jesus offered. It takes what it takes. There's no shortcuts. You can't just, you know, uh, willy-nilly decide whatever you want. Like the, the parts of Christianity that you want to do, I'll do. And the parts I don't want to do, ah, you know what, God will understand. No, it takes what it takes. And God has gone on record and told you exactly what it takes. So it says in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? Does everybody get that? Let's just look at it. All right? It's self-explanatory. 
Does everybody get this? Jesus is the vine, if you want to know the, the metaphorical nature here. All right. He says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will produce fruit. You'll produce fruit. You want to know what kind of fruit? Galatians tells us all about these fruits. Love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You, you're missing any of those? All right. Then you got to check the connection. It's like your Wi-Fi. Everyone in this day and age understands that Wi-Fi goes down. It is like the seventh circle of hell is descending upon your house, right? I've never seen something so amazing that a teenager without Wi-Fi. Yeah, what's going on? Never concerned about it. A house could be on fire, and if the Wi-Fi was connected, you know, you know. But let that Wi-Fi go down, and concern finally hits their soul. Whenever you are not producing the things that you'd like to produce, whenever your relationship is not producing love, better check the connection. Whenever you're not producing patience, better check the connection. Kindness. 2023, I think I'm going to work on kindness. And as a pastor, you know, I'm full of love. Full of love. But sometimes I am impatient. And then I turn into condescending, you know, and a little bit of sarcasm. And sometimes I say to myself, you know, too much. Too much, you know. You got to have this conversation with yourself. You know, a little bit funny, but a lot, I think it starts to, you know, you're, you're kind of using that as a, as a crutch for bad behavior. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Kindness. I think that's a, that's a fading um, attribute in our culture. I think we need a little bit more of that. If you're lacking in kindness, better check the connection. Here he's saying that he's the vine and you are the branch. Now when you're connected to him, you're going to produce, baby. I mean, it's going to be, you're going to produce. Your life is going to produce the good stuff, the God stuff. But he also puts caveat in there, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing. You want the chance to change? You got to be connected, connected to life. Now, at our house, I'll illustrate this. Um, for two years, we had an, I don't know if you want, we call it annual tree. And my wife loves decorating a Christmas tree, all right? Um, and so we thought, why well, don't we have a seasonal tree? And so we're going to show you some pictures at this juncture. Um, we had, for two years, you know, there's a Christmas tree. All right, next, um, that would be, um, I'm going to say Valentine's, okay. Oh, yeah, there's little hearts. And then uh, Easter, St. Patrick's. I'm not the decorator. Next, Easter, there we oh, I go. Oh, we're going in order. I got it now. Next, we got to get through these. Oh, 4th of July, America. Um, and now I think we got a last one. Oh, of course, the most important tree, um, fall tree, although it's known as football tree. All right, take it off. Take it off. No, no, never mind. That's my family being funny. Um, I want us to look at the relationship between the centerpiece and the season, okay? Whenever you walk into my house and you see the tree, you would know with one glance what season it is, right? Everybody get that? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. There's a relationship between the season and the centerpiece that is in your life. When Jesus is the vine and everything's connected to him, he becomes the centerpiece. And it doesn't take people long. If you ever meet someone who's walking with Jesus, it doesn't take you long because they don't act like everyone else. They don't respond like everyone else. It's a rarity. It's a commodity. It's amazing, though, if you hang out with people. Have you ever hung out with, <laughs> you ever hung out with a person in a marriage that is going through um, a rough patch? Has anybody, everybody ever visited someone's house like, hey, we're going to have you over for dinner. And then you get to their house and no one's talking and it's, like you can feel it. Has anybody, has everybody experienced this? It's like, ah. 
something is amiss. <laughs> something is afoot. <laughs> and you don't really, you can't say anything, right? You haven't been invited into this. God forbid. I've been in those too. We were just in a fight and we want you to be the referee. <laughs> Pastor. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen someone after a rough night has anybody ever seen someone after a rough night like you're sitting at breakfast with sunglasses on has anybody ever seen has anybody ever seen this they're like just please don't talk to me right now it doesn't take long to see what season they are in right some of you think that you walk in here and it's hidden <laughs> What season that you're going through, trust me, it doesn't take long to know what season you're in. And even if you could fool us, you can't fool God. God took, takes one look at your life and he knows what the centerpiece is. Is it yourself or is it Jesus? Because when we're connected to Jesus, we produce things. And when we're not connected to Jesus, we produce things. So I want to encourage you to make abiding in Christ a priority in 2023. If you want the chance to change the most important things, then it starts with your spiritual connection to life. You have to prioritize the connection, which means that you have to choose it. When things start trying to compete with that connection, you have to prioritize it. You have to protect it. Think about this. He says, abide. And if you read this passage, these first five verses of John 15, he says, abide like eight times. Now, why would he say that? If, if you could just plop down and abide in Christ, and that was just like what you did, then he wouldn't have to say it over and over again. The only reason why he's saying it is that there's a force that is constantly pushing you. You could even say forces right? You could say your flesh, you could say sin, you could say the world, you could say spiritual forces that are opposed to God. These things are constantly pressing on your life. And when you become unsteady as a result of your busyness or a little lack of attention to your spiritual things, what happens is you get off balance and at some juncture you get tipped into a direction away from God. And it's so subtle, but then before you know it, you are way afar from God. And when you start thinking about it, you probably can't even think about where it began because it was so subtle. But now you look at your life and you aren't abiding in Christ. Your language doesn't reflect that you're abiding in Christ. Your habits don't reflect that you're abiding in Christ. Your prioritization of God's word, God's will, his church, none of those things are at the top of your list of things to do. Ergo, how can you maintain the connection? Because He's not talking about relationship. He's not talking about whether or not a person is in the family. He's talking about, are you friends? Think about that for just a moment. Are you friends with God? Like, if you called him up on the phone, would he know your voice? Well, he'd be like, uh, who's this? Like, I haven't heard from you in like five years. Do you hang out with him? You hang out at his house? Think about that. If someone only came around your house when they wanted something, you probably wouldn't call them friend. I'm just encouraging you to start thinking about macro level, how do you change? You have to connect to the vine. And that's the way you change. As a matter of fact, Paul affirms this concept in Romans 11, verse 18. Look at this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Don't get it twisted. You're not, you're not up here and like this service rises and falls on you. All right? Like when you come to church, it just hits a little different. No. You need this. You need this in your life. The root is what's supporting you. You're not supporting Christ. You're not making Christ Christ. You're not making God God. You're not adding anything to who God is by your connection, but God is adding, adding everything to you via that connection. Paul was making the argument that once you're grafted in, that root is supporting you. So your connection to life, the abundant life, 
is directly due to how good that connection is. The last one in John chapter 15, right after he says abide in life, he talks about abiding in love. And these are the two things I think it takes to change. He said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. He says, abide in my love. We're just going to walk through this as we wrap up. He says, abide in my love. Okay? Is it your love? Or is it God's love, right? He says, don't, your, your, your resting spot, your anchoring point is not your love. Not the type of love that you describe. He says, it's the type of love that I create. And God's love is not a feeling love. It has a feeling to it, but it's not like a, if I feel it today. Because sometimes whenever marriages get rocky, I hear people saying, I just don't know if I feel. <laughs> I just don't know if I feel, you know, love. That's just you justifying. Listen, when you got married, it's a choice. The love of God is a choice. I will guarantee you there are times that God looks at me and I bet he doesn't feel like loving me. And I know for sure some of you, I know for sure. Like he's like, it's going to be a hard day, Tim. It's be a hard day. I'm still going to love them, but it, they're getting on my nerves. He says, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, well, now that sounds transactional, right? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. All right, so he's saying that there's something you need to do in order to abide in my love. So you can't abide in his love if you don't do whatever the stipulation is. And I'm so glad he tells us exactly what the stipulation is. He says, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So he says, follow my example. All right, follow my example. I abided in my Father's love as I walked on this earth, and now you follow that example. He says, these things, and here's the connection, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Okay, let's leave that up there for just a moment. There's a connection between God's love and happiness, okay? And there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is like how you feel when you have your favorite Whataburger sandwich, okay? That's, that's happiness, okay? Joy would be a more deep sustaining thing that allows you to be content, okay? So he's saying there that whenever you abide in this love, he said, I'm gonna put my joy in you, God's joy, God's happiness. I'm gonna put that in you. And then what is that gonna make? That's gonna make your joy full. See, you see the relationship? If you don't sit down in God's love, then your happiness, your joy can never be full. And I swear on the Bible, I think some of you, your joy has never ran over. Some, some people, they got the frowny face on all the time. You say amen if you know a frowny face. Anybody in here? Like, you can't tell me your face is lying, is what I'm trying to say. If, if you never smile, if there's never been a good day, like some people married to people, every day you come home and there is like a story of, of drama. It's like the Karen culture, right? It's like, you won't believe what happened. Does anybody ever feel like a machine gun is coming at you and you're like Neo? You're like dodging like all the, boy, all the bullets in the Matrix? It's like, you know, at some juncture, there just has to be a good day, right? If God's joy is inside of you, I mean, when's the last time your spouse came home and you both were like, man, we just had a great day today. It's possible that you might be fixated on the wrong things because if you're breathing, <laughs> then God blessed you today. And if you have something to be thankful for, it'll change the way you look at the day. If you are missing God's joy in your life, question, who moved? See, if he said, sit down in my love, that, that love, that, that place is a place. It's a place that you can anchor to, that you can be in. It's like a, a bubble, if you will, ecosystem. And if you ever find that you don't have God's joy in your life, he didn't move. 
God is seated in the heavens on a throne above. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change, the Bible says. In him there is no shadow. It's all light. So this morning, if your life isn't where you want it to be, and if it's not feeling the way you want it to feel, is it possible that your connection level needs to be checked and have you sat down inside of God's love? Because God's love can erase a lot of the guilt that you bear. And it can, it can uh, if you will, uh, what would be a word there? Whenever you have a big personality, sometimes that needs to be tempered because you're driven by ego and you need to have humility in your life. So when you sit down in God's love, it does all of these great things so that your joy may be full. So if you'd like a chance to change the level of joy that you live your life with this year, you gotta be connected first to the life, second to the love, and I close. This is my commandment. So what was the command that allows you to abide in the love? He says that you love one another as I have loved you. He said, greater love has no man than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. It takes love to love. It's simple. It takes what it takes. And what does it take? It takes God's love in you in order for you to correctly love others. You want to know why relationships get so messy and messed up? It's really simple. They are not governed by God's love. You're not... Your marriage is not governed by God's love. Your parenting is not governed by God's love. Real simple litmus test. Do you want your kid to be what you want them to be or do you want them to be what God wants them to be? They are not often synonymous. So now you're making that child your idol. They don't belong to you. That's God's. God has allowed you the blessing of having a baby. Having a child, and I promise you, everything changed the moment that you had a child. Everything. And what does it take to aim the arrow? It takes your family deciding that we need to be seated, anchored, prioritized, protected, the connection to God's life and God's love. And he said, when you're following me, when you're abiding in my love, the evidence will be the outward show of you laying down your life so that you can love others. That's what you do. You sacrifice so that others can find life and find love. It's that simple. If you are not sacrificing for others, you are not abiding in God's love, and your joy is not full. It's a simple, linear equation. So you want the chance to change? You got to choose, right? And there's not a whole bunch of choices. It's not like, what are we going to add in 2023? All these choices. No, remember what Saban said, according to this book, it takes what it takes. You have very few choices. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you, you have one choice. What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to say he's worth it all and I'm going to connect? I'm going to connect and prioritize what God's word says in 2023? Our marriage, we're in. Baby, we're in. We're making a, We're turning over a new page. We're turning a page. We're going to reconnect with Christ. We're going to reconnect with the body of Christ, a local church. We're going to fellowship. We're going to serve. We're going to do exactly what he said. We're going to love other people. He said that's the greatest form of obedience. The greatest love is the one that's self-sacrificing. Now tell me this. Does the world promote this type of love? Do they say, hey, when it comes to the aim of your life, you need to not worry about you. You need to worry about what God wants, and then you need to love others according to how God loved them. And so really, in no relationship would it be about you at all, ever. It would only be about what God's best is and then how can you show that God's best to someone else? Is that what the world teaches? I think the world teaches that you need to live your best life. You need to live your best life. <laughs> I'm living my best life. Apart from Christ? What did it say? You can do some things. 
You can do a little bit. What did it say? Nothing. You can do nothing. You can do nothing. How are you going to fix it? Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. How do you overcome the temptation? How do you overcome the addiction? How do you right the wrong? How do you mend the fence in a relationship that's been impossibly broken? How do you do that? In your own strength? No. You want it to be truly put back together? you got to choose Christ. And understand this, when you choose Christ, it's going to be losing you. It's not about what you want in the relationship anymore. You say, but they were wrong. Yeah, so were you. So was I. But what did God do? He loved me anyway. He forgave me before I even asked. He made the potential for forgiveness available. Is that how you're going into the negotiation? Is that how you're going into the arm summit? We're going to sit down tonight and we're going to have a talk. We both got our hand on the red button. <laughs> I dare you to say something that I take as an offense, even if you didn't mean to offend me. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> you know? That's the way many people handle conflict. If you want to be light in this world, you got to connect to the life, and then you got to connect to the love. And I promise you, it would be impossible for you not to have influence for God in this world. Chance to change starts with one choice, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you help us all, God, change. That we receive your word, and that, God, we would make you the centerpiece of our lives, that when people see us, it is unmistakable that we have chosen Jesus. God, we need so many more lights in this, in this dark world. As we're starting 2023, maybe some of you, this is gonna hit different today, where you realize, you know what? I need to make that change. I need to commit to that. I would encourage you that you could start with a prayer. <laughs> just simply pray during this reflection time, during the song, just simply pray, God, I want what you want for my life. God, I want what you want for my life. And leave the space blank. And you tell me by the end of this worship session, by the end of you drive home today after church, if God doesn't put something in your heart that says this area is not surrendered, this area is not connected, and I need you to lay that down, I need you to make this change. It would be so sad for me if like the young rich ruler, you heard this message, you had the opportunity, but because you love your own life so much, you would rather have it than the one that God created for you. Come on. If you've never believed in Jesus, if you've never become connected, if you've never been born again, as the Bible says, Jesus is literally holding out his hand. And he's saying, come on, my life is better. Everything about life is better with Jesus. Maybe today, you would take his hand and say, I want to make you my savior. I promise you, if you are willing to pray that, ask God to forgive you of your sins and accept what he did for you at the cross, your life would be radically changed forever. And the joy you've been chasing all your life and all these other things would be found in an instant. Would you guys join us as we worship?